My, my name has been closely associated with the city of Moline, but I didn't have my beginning here. And actually, my life's journey was a convoluted path through the years. I was born in Lima, New York in 1804, and from then, my family took me as a child to Ohio. From Ohio, I went to New Orleans. And then from New Orleans, I went back to New York to finish my education. Now the circumstance was that never happened. I got married instead. So my wife was from Shawneetown, Illinois, and that's when I finally came to Illinois uh, to be with her family. I moved to Shawneetown and farmed about 80 acres for about 14 years. And while I was there, I kept hearing stories about the beautiful Mississippi Valley and all of the wonders that it had to offer. This prompted me to want to come and see what the opportunities were for myself. Now, the Mississippi River is an awesome wonder. It can be tranquil and peaceful. It can also be full of energy and full of power and dangerous. And at the time, there were rapids between an island known as the Rock Island, which was named because it had a limestone base, and the shore. And the ra rapids represented an opportunity that I had that needed to be seized on. So it wasn't until 1836 that I actually came to this area. And when I did, I bought one of only three houses that were in the area of the town, or at the time, in a town called Rock Island Mills. Now that's no longer in existence today, so you won't recognize that. But I also bought a strip of land along the Mississippi. And that land was across the river from the Rock Island. And at that time, it wasn't the name of the town, it was the name of the island. Now it's known as the Rock Island Arsenal. My vision at that time was to use the rapids that were there and to build a dam so that I could harness the power of the river. I partnered with three men, J.W. Spencer, Calvin Ainsworth, and Spencer White. Now with them, we decided to build the dam in order to do that, I had to convince 40 men to volunteer to help me build the dam. The idea was to harness the power of that rapid flow of water. Now what it did besides that, it also created another benefit in that the water was diverted to the main channels and that allowed the steamboats to travel in a safely manner. And because of that, they were able to bring people and supplies and prosperity and help the city to grow. So to build the dam, we used logs. We, some of them were 30 feet long that we cut. We weighted them down with brush and rocks and slowly built the dam until it was 600 feet long and was wide enough for a wagon and a team of horses. Now at the downstream side of the dam, I built a water flume out of wood that directed the water towards a water wheel that we had that was also connected to a mill. Now the water powered the wheel, which powered the mill and ground corn and wheat, and at the same time, powered a saw, the sawmill. And with the sawmill, we were able to cut lumber, which helped to build the houses and the shops and the foundries that were in the area. So that was the start of it. Now, in order to have lumber to cut, or wood to cut into lumber, we had to cut trees in Wisconsin and float them down the river. Now, I was always inter interested in anything that would simplify the work and lighten the workload. So I had a rotary saw delivered to the area, which was the first one in the Mississippi Valley area. Now my workers looked at that as a new modern convenience and they didn't like it. They felt it encroached upon their their rights, and but eventually they became used to it and embraced it. Now all this prosperity encouraged other settlers and visionaries to come to the area, including John Deere and they built factories and foundries. Not only did it bring the visionaries in the factories, but it also required people to come to the area to work in the factories. So that brought more people, it brought their families, and required the building of more towns, more houses, more shops, more schools. At the same time, with the partners that I had in 1841, we decided to build another mill. So we built the largest mill within 100 miles and it cost us $30,000 to build at, at that time. That would equate to about $700,000 in today's money. 
Now, all of this prosperity occurred before the Civil War. And when the Civil War happened, I felt it was my civic duty to enlist in the war. So at the age of 52, I enlisted as quartermaster and had the rank of captain. Now, I never really saw a lot of battle, although I was captured. And I was held for a while, but I was released in a prisoner exchange. And in a letter I wrote to my daughter, Sarah, I said the soldiers were 10 times more likely to die of disease than they were of being killed in battle. And those poor souls were buried where they fell on the paths and the roadways in a strange land and with no stones to mark where they were at. Now, during the same time, the government wanted land to build to make an armory, and they felt the island was the prime spot. So the Rock Island, as it was known at the time, became the Rock Island Arsenal. They bought the land from me for $145,175, which in today's money would equate to over a million dollars. Now I took that money and I bought 500 acres along the north shore of Rock River and built another mill and used the power of the Rock River to power the mill and save that. Now I named the town Sears Town after me, of course. Um, that town lasted for about 30 years after my death and then in 1915 was annexed into the city of Rock Island. Now all of this sounds like I had a very prosperous life and a lot of success, but my personal life was one that was full of tragedy. When my family moved from Lima, New York to Ohio, two of my sisters drowned. And my wife died in 1835 at the age of 26. I remarried Delilah and she lived until 1862, at which time she died. And then I married Eunice. And that was a mistake. And Eunice and I ended up divorcing. And then I married again in 1871 when I was 71 years old. Now my wife, Margaret, at the time was 32. Not bad for an old guy. <laughs> now during all those marriages, I had 13 children. The first eight were all girls, and a few of those died in early childhood. It wasn't until my ninth child was born that I actually had a son named David after me, and he was considered to be the first white boy in the area. His playmates were Native American Indians, and he went on to manage my manufacturing after my death. Now, the community considered me a man of sterling principles, honest and well-respected. I was opposed to the idea of slavery, and I refused many attempts for me to buy slaves as I traveled between Moldy and New Orleans. I also was an advocate of temperance, and I actually moved from the city of Milan because there were too many bars and saloons. Now, all of that came to an abrupt end when I was 80 years old, and I suffered a heart attack when I was in my mill. Even though I was a person who believed in working up to the last minute, I actually did. And I suffered the heart attack in the mill when I was talking to my office manager. David Benton Sears, 1804 to 1884. Thank you.